డాక్టర్ నైని డాక్టర్ అవినైని షీజ్ నాట్ దర్ షీజ్ నాట్ నైని యూఆర్ రవినైని ఇట్ కేమ్ రాంగ్ యూఆర్ Dr. Lechna will present. Good morning, respected teachers. Myself, Dr. Leshna, presenting a rare case report of Vogue Koenagi Harada disease with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. VKH disease is bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis associated with serous retinal detachment with or without extraocular manifestations affecting young adults. In 1932, Bebel suggested to call this entity as VKH disease. It is a T cell driven autoimmune reaction associated with HLA DR1, DR4 of subtype 0405 and it presents in three forms complete, incomplete, and probable VKH. My case report, a 20-year-old female whose occupation is student came with a defect, a chief complaint of defective vision in left eye since three days and headaches since one week. Defective vision in left eye is sudden in onset, not associated with pain, redness, photophobia, no history of lotus, no history of ocular trauma, ocular surgery or ocular infection, no history of photopsia, micropsia, macropsia or metamorphopsia. Headache which is bilateral, frontal, not associated with nausea, vomiting or reeling sensation, no history of tinnitus and hearing impairment. Past history, there is history of prodromal illness five days before defective vision associated with headache, orbital pain, light sensitivity, and mild fever. She is a known case of hypothyroidism on tap thyroxine sodium. Personal history, family history, or nil significant. Menstrual history, she is a known case of PCOS. General examination, no signs of meningismus, no signs of alopecia, vitiligo, poliosis. Vitals and systemic examination are within normal limits. Local examination also within normal limits. On ocular examination, I will come to positive findings. In both eyes, uncorrected visual acuity is 612 parts, not improving with pinhole. Near vision is N6 and color vision is 17 by 17. Apart from cornea showing fine pigmented capes in a vertical line and AC showing grade 1 cells, rest all anterior segment findings are within normal limits in both eyes. IOP with GAT recorded at 11 a.m. in right eye to be 12 and left eye to be 10 mm HG. Fundus evaluation with IVO and 90D in both eyes showed media clear optic disc normal and serous macular detachment with foveal, dull foveal reflex in both eyes. Here is the fundus image of both right and left eye showing a serous macular detachment in both eyes. Based on the above clinical findings, we came to a provisional diagnosis of probable VKH disease with hypothyroidism query Hashimoto's thyroiditis. On further clinical evaluation, we have done OCT macula, where in both eyes showed multiple pockets of subretinal fluid suggestive of neurosensory retinal detachment with RPE alteration and choroidal thickening. And fundus fluorescein angiography in both eyes showed early hypo with multiple pinpoint hyperfluorescence with RPE alteration establishing our diagnosis. B scan of both eyes showed increased choroidal thickening. 
her TSH is also elevated, showing mic 10 micro international units per ml. Adding to it, her anti TPO antibodies were also elevated, 6.9 international units per ml, whose biological reference value is less than 5.61, suggestive of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. To exclude other autoimmunity, all just we have done ANA, which came out to be weak, positive, showing 1 is to 40 sample dilution. Her ESR is also elevated. She was treated with both eyes periocular triamcinolone astonide injections along with systemic tap prednisolone 60 mgod with pantop, calcium, vitamin D3, and thyroxine sodium 50 micrograms once daily, regular TSH monitoring. Referral has been done to ENT and dermatology departments to exclude possible hearing impairment where Puritan audiometry came with the normal limits and dermat no integumentary signs were noted. Review after one week, her visual equity in right eye improved to 6-9 paths and left eye it is 6-6 paths. Simultaneous OCT here if you see. This is pre-steroid injections macular status and this is post-steroid injections. All the subretinal fluid got resolved and the RPA changes still seen in both eyes. Review after one week, there is modification in the treatment regimen. Tab mycophenolate morphotil 500 mg OD is added the following week in combination with oral steroid, tapering 5 mg weekly. Here if you see tab MMF, it has been seen in incremental dosage from OD to TID, while steroid dose has been tapered from 60 to 45, tapering 5 mg weekly. Currently, she is on tab prednisolone 10 mg once daily and tab MMF 500 mg TID along with thyroxine sodium 50 micrograms OD with TSH under control and regular follow-up. Coming to discussion in our case, good visual equity is achieved by early diagnosis with OCT FFA followed by aggressive therapy with periocular and oral steroids in acute uveitic stage and maintenance therapy with a combination of both steroid and antimetabolites. MMF being safe and effective steroid sparing drug, it is a preferred antimetabolite in combination with steroids on long term treatment as it prevents progression of VKH to chronic recurrence stage. Diagnosis of Hashimoto's with positive anti TPO antibodies, exclusion of other autoimmune disorders like lupus choroidopathy with negative ANA and referral to ENT dermat departments for evaluation of extraocular manifestations is important in our case management. Conclusion, visual prognosis depends upon early treatment with steroids and immunosuppressants that results in fair prognosis with 60 to 70 percent retaining vision 6-9 or even better as achieved in my patient. Prevention of recurrence leading to choroidal neovascular membrane and subretinal fibrosis is important in order to restore good visual potential. My case highlights the importance of management and evaluation of VKH in detail to find out any other associated autoimmune disorders like Hashimoto's that lead to serious systemic complications like heart failure, lymphoma, etc. These are my references. Thank you. So what are the features supporting your diagnosis? Why do you say it is VKH syndrome? Ma'am, there is posterior uveitis bilateral presentation, mm -hmm. as well as there are multiple serous uh, retinal detachments with AC cells and flare, and our flu fundus fluorescein angiography also suggests early hypofluorescence and multiple pinpoint leakage points. Suggest bilateral serous detachment is your actual finding. But uh, the skin lesions and all, they were not there. there are, this is a probable VKH where mm -hmm. we see only bilateral ocular manifestations yeah. without any neurological or integumentary findings. Not there no. in your case. Yes, so this was the first presentation? Yes, I mean, ma'am. According to the patient? Yes, ma'am. So this was not the recurrence also? No, ma'am. First time the patient we, has presented? We have uh, early diagnosed and uh, we are preventing uh, further this progression. <coughs> Why did you treat with periocular steroids instead of systemic steroids? Periocular steroids will decrease the local inflammation and relieve her from the illness. Systemic steroids also, she's kept on systemic steroids along with periocular steroids. Yes. Yes. She's 20 years. Did you give uh, vitamin supplements along when one is taught with steroids or immunosuppressants? Vitamin supplements. Yes, sir, immunosuppressants. Vitamin, vitamin supplements. Yeah, we have given vitamin D3, calcium, pantoprazole. Mm -hmm. And regular CBP right? monitoring, evaluation of cytopenia, eleva any elevation of transaminase, we are regularly monitoring her liver function test as well, sir. 20 to years reduce also the local is too early to start steroid. on uh, immunosuppressants. I mean, she has not even completed the family. She we need to take a big decision to start an immunosuppressant. This is a preferred one. And she is also counseled on long The way she would land in pan uveitis, uh, smoldering pan uveitis in recurrent states. Thank you, sir. Dr. Roja.
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर रोजा आई एम गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट ए केस ऑफ बायोलेट्रल रेटनल वीनस अक्लूजन इसकी मिक्स सी आर वी वो लेफ्ट आई बी आर वी वो राइट आई सेकेंडरी टू प्राइमरी एंगल क्लोजर ए रेयर केस रिपोर्ट इंट्रोडक्शन रेटनल वीन अक्लूजन विद सी आर वी वो और बी आर वी वो रिजल्ट इन रूबियोसिस आयरडीज एंड नियोवेस्कुलर ग्लोकोमा सी आर वी वो इज एदर इसकीमिक और नॉन इसकीमिक बी आर वी वो इज अ ब्लॉकेज ऑफ ट्रिब्यूटरीज ऑफ सेंट्रल रेटनल वेन सीरियस मैक्लर डिटैचमेंट्स और कॉमन विद इसकीमिक सी आर वी वो primary angle closure with raised iop as a precipitating cause is a rarity with associated hypertension nephropathy and anemia being risk factors psc or pscg can cause mechanical displacement of the main venous trunk leading to stretching weakening of the vein wall and compression collapse of the vein leading to venous stasis and obstruction of the central retinal vein a 53 year old female came with a complaint of defective vision in left eye 2 months headache 1 month history of presenting complaint defective vision in the left eye 2 months sudden onset headache not associated with vomitings and no other positive history past history history of hypertension since 2 years not using any medication personal and family history nil significant general examination anemia is present vitals blood pressure is 180 by 100 mmhg systemic examination and local examination is normal ocular examination right eye uncorrected visual acuity 6 by 36 best correction 6 by 6 anterior chamber quite shallow vh grade 1 lens early imsc iop is 18 mm hg and rest all anterior segment findings are normal left eye uncorrected visual acuity 2 by 60 with best correction not improving anterior chamber quite shallow vh grade 1 pupil rapd grade 1 lens early imsc and iop is 40 mm hg and rest all anterior segment findings are normal indentation gonioscopy both eye angles are narrow no signs of neovascularization fundus examination of right eye media is hazy due to cortical opacities od temporal pallor is present av ratio 2 is to 4 venous engorgement is present foveal reflex is present peripheral retina superficial flame shaped hemorrhages present along the superior temporal vascular arcade with cotton wool spots remaining peripheral retina is normal fundus examination of the left eye media is hazy due to cortical opacities od is hyperemic edematous physiological cup obliterated blurring of margins present elevation of the disc 1 mm av ratio 2 is to 4 venous engorgement is present foveal reflex is absent macular edema is present peripheral retina multiple superficial hemorrhages present all over the fundus with some cotton wool spots in the peripapillary and macular area on on uh, above clinical findings my provisional diagnosis is ischemic central retinal vein occlusion left eye superior temporal branch retinal vein occlusion right eye secondary to primary angle closure both eyes with immature senile cortical cataract both eyes and further evaluation oct of left eye shows serous macular detachment and oct of right eye is normal patient is managed with brimatoprost astrazolamide and nsaids for 3 days both eyes laser peripheral iridotomy was done and iop reduced right eye 12 mm hg left eye 10 mm hg intravitreal ranibizumab injection was given in left eye and after three doses of anti vegfs in left eye visual acuity improved from counting finger 2 meter to counting finger 5 meter and iop is maintained fundus and macular status post anti vegf agents in left eye after first dose there is resolution in the retinal hemorrhages in the right eye along the superior temporal arcade and resolution of the retinal hemorrhages and exudates in the left eye no ct shows resolving macular edema after second and third dose there is further resolution of the retinal hemorrhages and exudates in both eyes and resolving macular edema oct angiography of left eye shows enlargement of the foveal avascular zone and capillary non perfusion areas whereas right eye is normal and erg shows loss of oscillatory potentials in the left eye and right eye is normal As the patient is having systemic comorbidities, the following systemic investigations are done. ECG shows left ventricular hypertrophy changes. 2D echo ejection fraction is 57%. Serum creatinine 2.5 mg per dl. Hb 7.6 gram per cent. Peripheral smear shows anemia with eosinophilia. Lipid profile is normal. Ultrasound abdomen shows bilateral grade 3 renal parenchymal changes. Hb electrophoresis is normal. Cycling test is negative. and patient was referred to general medicine and nephrology and the following treatment was advised discussion ischemic crvo leading to neovascular glaucoma is a serious complication with comorbidities like hypertension nephropathy anemia and cardiac dysfunction primary angle closure disease with acute attack acts as an important risk factor for precipitating crvo as we have seen in this case chronic kidney disease leading to hyperviscosity and anemia are additional risk factors for precipitation of crvo in our case conclusion bilateral retinal venous occlusion crvo left eye brvo right eye with serous macular detachment in left eye secondary to pac is a rare entity which is highlighted in this case thorough evaluation of the angle of the anterior chamber by gonioscopy iop monitoring in patients with comorbidities will avoid such complications as crvo which can lead to neovascular glaucoma treatment of comorbid conditions like anemia hypertension nephropathy are important in the management thank you
presentation. So did you do any laser for the right eye? Yes, ma'am. Both eyes laser peripheral arrhythmia was done. So that was done. Yes, and the patient is being followed up. Yes, ma'am. Till now the patient is fine. Yes, ma'am. What can be the hypothesis behind the primary angle closure causing bilateral occlusions? Uh, primary angle closure is a risk factor for uh, central retinal vein occlusions. Sir. Maybe phacomorphic component may also be present as the patient has IMSC also. Have you done carotid Doppler in this case? No, sir. As the patient has many comorbid conditions, so we deferred that. Uh, Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Pravalika, second year postgraduate. Today, my topic is uh, quantitative monitoring of papilledema evolution using spectral domain optical coherence tomography. Financial interest, nil. Introduction, papilledema is defined as an optic disc swelling that is secondary to the elevated intracranial pressure. Papilledema usually presents as a bilateral phenomenon and may develop over hours to weeks. Early diagnosis of papillarima can help in early intervention and thus preventing the vision loss and even death. The main objective is to evaluate the role of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness during papillarima course. Study methodology, the study design, a hospital-based prospective observational study, sample size 28, study place, Department of Ophthalmology, Jimsar, Vishakapatnam, study period from September 2022 to June 2023. All subjects underwent detailed ophthal examination, including refraction, color vision, slit lamp examination for anterior segment and fundus examination. Average RNFL thickness measurement with SDOCT. Uh, after treatment, follow-up was done at first and third months for papilledema patient, and there was no follow-up for the controls. Patients between 8 to 50 years of age with papilledema are included as cases and healthy volunteers between 8 to 50 years of age who do not have any signs of papilledema and no neurological disorders or other systemic illnesses were included as controls. Exclusion criteria, patients with the neurologic disorders other than papilledema, patients with media opacities such as corneal opacities, vitreous hemorrhage and cataract are excluded and patients who did not give consent were excluded. Results, the gender distribution shows males are 43% and females 57%. This is the fundus picture and the OCT picture at the first visit. Uh, the fundus picture of a patient shows media is clear, the disc is hyperemic with the uh, blood margins and uh, tortuous vessels and the FR is present. And the OCT shows the total RNFL thickness in the right eye shows 185 and the left eye shows 195. This is the fundus photo and the OCT picture at second visit, that is after one month, there is, was a resolution in the uh, fundus and the RNFL thickness shows uh, 145 in the right eye and 161 in the left eye. This is the fundus picture and OCT at the third visit where the uh, uh, RNFL thickness shows 108 and 105 in the left eye. Fundus picture and the OCT for the controls where the RNFL thickness was 101 in the right eye and 107 in the left eye. Distribution of the mean RNFL thickness for the cases shows the, for in the first visit the mean was 175 and in the second visit it was 145 and in the third visit it came to be 110. This is a table showing the distribution of average RNFL thickness for the cases and controls. 
So the first visit is 174 plus or minus 20.5 and in the second visit it is 145.6 plus or minus 14.2 and in the third visit it is 114.8 plus or minus 12.3 and for the controls it is 101.7 plus or minus 6. So the mean difference was in the first, when compared to the first visit, the mean difference was 72.9 plus or minus 12.4 and in the second visit it is 43.9 plus or minus 16.2 and in the third visit it was almost similar. So the mean RNFL thickness was 71.68 percentage greater than in the control eyes. At first follow up visit the mean RNFL thickness was 43.16 greater than in the control eyes. Among 14 patients, RNFL thickness normalized, but in one patient, it was progressing at even at the third month follow. Our study emphasizes the role of SDOCT in diagnosis and monitoring of papilledma in a Vishakhapatnam population. So these are the studies who has conducted a cross-sectional study which included 24 subjects and 22 controls and they showed that average RNFL thickness will be decreasing in the subsequent follow-up visits. And there's a one more study, Ahuja et al, who conducted a case control study and has taken 100 cases and 126 controls and concluded that the positive correlation was found between frisson grading of papilledema and the RNFL thickness measurement. Panyala R. et al. conducted a cross-sectional study from December to June and he has taken 30 papillitis and 30 papilledema and 30 controls and he has concluded that the RNFL thickness normalized at three months of follow-up and the RPE, Brooks membrane angle, progressively decreased but normalized at six months of follow-up. So my conclusion is the data support the possible use of SDOCT as a non-invasive quantitative method of monitoring the amount and the evolution of the papilledema. These are my references and thank you. Good presentation. We have finished our session now. Uh, all are very innovative concepts. Thank you for the cases.